Uh, I'm not quite sure what to say about myself that's relevant other than uh, you know, I grew up in New York City and worked as a bike messenger for some time, and that is where I got my ethical training. <laughs> Um, I am currently a professor of computer science and engineering at UC San Diego. I've been here for about 20 years. And um, I would never have guessed that 20 years hence I would be here talking about ethics. I focus on cybersecurity. We tend to think of you know, this as a very mechanistic discipline. Uh, and you know, there are ones and zeros, and sometimes they're wrong, and you switch them from one to zero, and then everything's good. And how could that possibly involve ethics? And part of it, I think, is about how we've how. It, we have evolved how we think about cybersecurity, but in particular how uh, I and my colleagues have focused on researching cybersecurity. So to kind of give some context on that, traditionally, the way we've thought about computer security is in terms of mechanisms. That there are some vulnerabilities in our systems, and if we fix them, then we're secure. It's kind of you know, the equivalent of the holes in the dike. If you put your finger in all the holes, then you don't have a problem anymore, and then we'd be safe. And the, in a certain kind of banal sense that is, Absolutely true. Post hoc, after everything that went wrong, if we said, well, only that thing hadn't happened, then we would be fine. And that is absolutely correct. Um, but does not capture the reality of what is going on on an ongoing basis. And, and that, that is that there is this complementary view. Yes, there are these mechanisms that have to be improved. We have to remove vulnerabilities. We have to make things more robust. We have to make um, them uh, uh, be, survive certain classes of attack better. But the other complementary view is that the technology is simply a medium in which this conflict is taking place. Right? The reason we have computer security problems is because someone is out to get us. Right? <laughs> Bottom line. Right? If they weren't, we wouldn't care. Right? If, without burglars, we wouldn't care about locks on the door. Right? So it's, the reason we care is that there is a conflict. There's a lot of different kinds of conflict, but fundamentally there's a conflict. And that means there's some other party that is interested in doing things that are adverse to us. And the technology is the medium that that plays out. And they can shift from one part of it to another. And so this complementary view of looking at computer security, which is one that we spend a lot of time looking at, is can we try to understand this from the standpoint of the adversary and not just from the standpoint of the mechanisms? And what are their incentives and dependencies? And how does that play into how we can all be safer? And so the core idea that motivates a lot of this work, some of which I'll talk about today, is that, look, we could maybe do a better job designing security interventions if we understood what are the interplay between these technical factors and these socioeconomic factors. And that latter part where you start touching people, that's where we start to touch these ethical issues. Um, and so just I'm going to put up a slide that has a big, long list. This is the kind of things my group tends to do. We do big measurement studies. We try to measure the security of the way the world is today. And so try to understand things like, OK, so like, what is the economics of malware? People who are writing malware, how do they get paid? How much do they get paid? What's the return on investment? How does that work as a business? Um, when someone steals your account or there's a data breach, well, how does that work? Like, Who gives it to whom? How does it get handed off? Does someone contract for it? You know, All of those kinds of things. Um, so. Ethical issues show up in a ton of places, it turns out, none of which I anticipated. And, uh, and they have to do with things like, is this thing you want to do to figure this thing out? Is that an ethical thing to do, that, that measurement you want to make? Is that, can you do that measurement in an ethical fashion? Um, then sometimes you get results of research saying, would it be ethical for you to tell people the results? Are the results themselves potentially problematic? And sometimes it's the goal of the research. Is it ethical to ask the question such and such? Um, and I'll, I'll touch on some examples of some of these. I, I will highlight where there's an issue, but I will not necessarily talk about the issue here. And we'll do that in kind of the, the panel session. So I'll leave, I'll leave you, it open for you guys to think through what some of the other issues that I may not have considered are. All right, so I'm going to really talk about three different examples that uh, touch on some of the different things we've run into. Um, the first one is uh, some, some uh, early work that we did that is about um, that is a particular mechanism that we use online that you're all familiar with called the CAPTCHA. And the CAPTCHAs are there to deal with the problem that we have with free accounts. Whenever you make something free, it's not really free. It's being paid for with something else. And typically, that's advertising. And there's, so there's an implicit deal that 
um, whenever you get a free account, it means that you are a unique set of eyeballs that is being exposed to some advertisers who are ultimately paying for all of the computers and so forth that make this work. Um, so this would work great, except that um, if people can sign up for millions of these things in an automated fashion, then it undermines that, that implicit contract that's going on. Because then if someone could sign up for a million Gmail accounts and then send lots of spam for them, that, that no longer is, you know, you can't sell ads for spammers. Like, no one wants to sell ads to spammers. And so the solution that much, one of the solutions industry came up with is this thing called a CAPTCHA. You sign up for a new free thing, and it gives you some outrageous little, you know, doodad that you have to interpret, where the premise is that this is something that is a human can look at and figure out, at times I wonder, um, <laughs> but that it's hard for a computer to do. And so that, that, that fact that a human needs to do the work will prevent it from being automated and create these mass signups. All right, so you might ask the question, how well do CAPTCHAs work? And this is actually a fairly tricky question to ask about any security mechanism. So security metrics are really tough. We don't know how to measure security. If, I, if you go and say, well, which, should I buy Norton antivirus or McAfee antivirus? And how many units of security does this one offer versus, like, there's no such thing. There's no such number that exists. We don't know how to measure that. Um, so the way that we approached this was thinking about it economically, because it turned out that as soon as people introduced CAPTCHAs, the bad guys were like, oh, crap, we got to solve CAPTCHAs. So there turns out that there is a retail market for solving them, uh, so that criminals can go and still do their mass uh, sign-up of accounts. And so what we might say, if we think about this from an economic standpoint, is the price to solve a CAPTCHA is a cost on the balance sheet of the attacker who is trying to artificially sign up large numbers of accounts. All right? And, well, how much does it cost them? One way to do this is to engage directly with this market. And there are multiple ways, it turns out, you can engage. One is, on a retail basis, you say, I would like to buy solutions to CAPTCHAs, and here's, you know, I'm going to give you a bunch and you will pay me. And there's a ton of services that will do this that are pretty sketchy, but um, you go there and you do this. The other is that it turns out that the way much of this works is with humans, all right? So you have some service that wants to do mass sign up, say, for Twitter, and uh, the computer software will recognize there's a capture here, it'll grab a picture, and it sends it off to some third-party service. The service that I'm describing here is called dCAPTCHA, which in turn, has a, um, a partner program called PixProfit that just hires extremely low-cost labor, largely from China and Bangladesh, who just sit there and solve these things all day. That's all they do, all right? And so they just sit and solve CAPTCHAs eight hours a day. Um, and it gets automatically routed to one of the hundreds of workers that this particular organization has. They solve it, they send it back, and then in the course of a very short period of time, about the same time as it takes a normal human to do it, uh, actually faster than you and I would do it, because they've been doing it all day, so they're quite good at it. Um, uh, you get an answer back, and then this just gets plugged into a computer program, and so it's this computer program that has mechanically used human labor, right? And so it just calls out every time it wants one of these solved, and then puts it back in, and then they can get their, their solutions. All right. So, um, so we signed up on both sides for a number of these different services. One is a customer. So we paid to have CAPTCHAs solved, saying, hey, we want to solve this. And sometimes we would solve a lot to see at what point couldn't, they couldn't solve anymore. Um, and on the other hand, we would sign up as a laborer and say, yeah, we're willing to solve CAPTCHAs uh, for money. And we would, that would let us see you know, what kinds of CAPTCHAs did we get, and so on and so forth. In both cases, we are engaging with potentially criminal activity in different contexts, and there are different ways in which ethical issues come up in this one. Now, and I, we can talk later about the ways that we tried to address these issues. Um, one of the benefits that came out of this, though, is that we were able to say very crisply, all right, here's the cost structure of capture solving. Here's where it's not going to go below, because this represents basically what the prevailing minimum wage in low-wage countries that have internet access is going to be. And it changed the way that places like Google and Yahoo and so forth think about this, that this is not a defense, it is a filter. 
it ensures that the people who are abusing your service need a business model that has a good enough return on investment to pay for capture solving. And um, does anyone want to guess how much it costs to solve a capture? Three cents. Three cents and a tenth of a cent. A tenth of a cent. You are much closer. So um, it is about uh, it is about in bulk about fifty to seventy five cents per thousand. All right, and and you got a feel for these people uh, who are solving them. All right, so that's one, and I'll just let you kind of think about some of the challenges. So this is actually quite valuable for the companies to then think about. It also helps them figure out when they have to change their captures and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm going to shift to a related project, which was looking at. Um, the spam ecosystem, which is actually quite complex. And so this is kind of a, an animation of what goes on every time a spam message is sent in order for it to make the sender money, right? Because we tend to focus just on it arriving. But for them to make money on it, one of y'all has to click and buy the stuff, all right? And that's the bottom line. Otherwise, they wouldn't send it. And so we. You know, the, it comes in, and then someone has to click, and a lot of things need to happen at this point. So in this case, there, there's a domain name. It says, click on whatever this is, medshoprx.ru. There's a, what's called a domain registrar that you have to buy that domain name from. This one was in Russia. And then there has to be a thing called a name server to say, how do you find that server? This one was located in China. This is an actual example of a particular message. Then it has to get content. This was actually from a proxy server in Brazil. Then, actually, if you want to make the sale, it reaches back to this criminal enterprise called an affiliate program in Russia that had contracts with an Azerbaijani bank um, that could accept visa and then arranged to do drop shipping out of India back to you to get your Viagra in this particular case. And so all of these things need to work. Like, this is a complicated business, and these are all separate entities, all right, that in some sense are knowing or unknowingly involved in a conspiracy to put together this business. All right, so we asked ourselves, rather than think about this entirely in terms of how do I filter this stuff out, could we think about it in terms of what is it that makes spam profitable? There are all these different, you know, in that graph I showed you, any one of those edges, if you got rid of them, that message could not be monetized. And so then you might say, well, which edges are the most valuable edges? What does it mean to be most valuable? It means that if you, that it's cost effective to get rid of it, and that the replacement cost for the bad guy is high for them to find an alternative. Uh, and so we did this by building the world's most naive user, which was a stack of 40 servers that all day long took all the spam of all these big companies that they gave us and clicked on every single one. And then it would visit the sites. And then we created a system that could automatically categorize which ones belong to which um, uh, to which criminal program, we also had a student, and this is one of, where one of the ethical issues comes in, who, um, who joined two dozen criminal programs, uh, pretending to be that they wanted to be a spammer. Um, and then we purchased from all of these criminal organizations. Right? And so we had this big thing that would, make, uh, that would crawl everything and then buy stuff from all these spam advertised goods. And we had a special deal with a bank that then allowed us to track the flow of money to figure out when we bought something, where did that money go? This is rather unusual for a computer science effort. But you know, so we had all these people who would, stu grad students, who would you know, get these things in the mail. They would have like pharmaceuticals or you know, counterfeit Rolex watches. Or occasionally, we would get this textile that then you would kind of notice that one part was a little lumpier. And you'd find out that that's where the drugs were secretly hidden so that it could get out of Pakistan. And so we are un un unique in computer science in having a drug room. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but the result is that we were able to go through and look at all of the different resources. So for every, literally for like a billion spam messages, every resource that was required to make one of those uh, uh, monetizable and see what, what's the replacement cost if it were gotten rid of. And the, the, the sad news was that most of them have very low replacement costs. And this is why if you like shut down a cybercrime server, it doesn't matter. Or you take down a domain, because they can get another one for you know, $3 in five minutes. And the exception uh, was banks. So the banks who could accept Visa were few and far between. And there was uh, a variety of 
financial incentive mechanisms, in particular something called holdback forfeiture that I can go into in more detail if people are interested, that meant that when they lost one of these accounts, that for the kinds of cash, cash flow we were dealing with, they could be out you know, three or four million dollars. Uh, so it was a significant loss. And so we then spent a bunch of time working with Visa and MasterCard and the White House and some brand holders to put together a program uh, to do this. The first example was with Microsoft, and we effectively shut down the sale of counterfeit Microsoft software anywhere in the world for 18 months. It could not be done. And then we did some similar stuff with, uh, with pharmaceuticals, uh, maybe not quite as effectively. But here's kind of a qualitative example. We uh, started this in November 2011, uh, and these, as I said, we had a student who had joined a bunch of, this is a set of criminal organizations that sold counterfeit Microsoft software. And so we had a student who had joined these organizations pretending that they too wanted to be involved in the sale, and so they would get notifications from the boss, as it were, saying here's what's going on, and so this, you can think of this as like the battle damage assessment of cyber crime fighting. And so, of course, it was in Russian, because all, all these guys are Russian. Um, and so but this is what it translates to in English. We're having problems with our bank. Our accounts are frozen. We're temporarily forced to stop selling this stuff. Uh, another one said our bank has stopped working. We have to close. And then my favorite, because it's very Russian and very poetic, was this one, which I can't read in the native Russian, but it's the sun is setting <laughs> on the OEM on the OEM era. All right. Uh, so there were a ton of ethical issues here you know, that involved in large-scale interaction with, uh, with criminals, with joining criminal organizations, a bunch of others. I, I can tell you that everything that we did that involved an IRB had an IRB, and our general counsel was involved with everything. But it was non-trivial thinking through these things. These were not something you just go and do. And then the last one I'm going to put up, very different. Uh, uh, work that we did for some time focused on automobiles. Uh, and the way I uh, learned about it, automobile, the mental, my mental model is the Henry Ford model. There's this mechanical thing where there's like hydraulics and gears and something like that. And that has been true for a while. All right. So they're all computers that are between you and anything that's truly mechanical. So when you step on the gas in a modern car, uh, there is, what's really going on is there's a sensor. And a computer reads that and says, you know, the, the meat bag up top wants to go faster. Please go and change the you know, fuel and oxygen mixture to make us go faster. Because there's a ton of variables that they're doing. And, and a lot of this is for good reason. It makes cars more fuel efficient. It makes them more safe. Anti-lock brakes could not work if a computer was not in the way. Stability control is the same way. But it turns out that as this has grown, we've got tons of these computers that control everything in your car. They're all networked together, and then increasingly they're externally networked. And so today, a car is just like the most complicated distributed system that you personally own. There's nothing in your life that is close to it. Uh, their ballpark are going to be you know, 30 or 40 different computers in your car that will have millions of lines of code that are talking to each other over all of these different networks and are connected to the external world in ways that you may not recognized. Um, and so we did some work, this joint work with the University of Washington, showing that for very large numbers of cars uh, that we were able to sight unseen just take them over. All right, and so here's the kind of the, 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 the punchline, which is from a 60 Minutes piece that highlighted some of our... Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, Les that's Leslie Stahl, and we have remotely disabled her brakes, and she is uh, pushing on the brakes, and um, the part that's not shown here is when we had a little glitch and couldn't get her brakes back on. But, <laughs> but she survived. We've seen her in future shows. Um, and so this had a lot of, you know, so we did this work and we did disclosure, and that's where a lot of our ethical issues came down to is what can we safely say? Because we were at a, in a position at multiple times where we were actually able, there were probably seven million cars on the road that we could take over. Um, and the federal government didn't know what to do, and the manufacturer at the time, which was GM, was really not sure what to do. And we had to be very careful about how we talked about our work. Long term, there have been a lot of positive impacts. So, you know, literally hundreds of people hired into the different OEMs. There's a new standards process. The National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration has a test lab. There's, you know, many tens of millions of dollars in research. Cars are much more secure today as a result. But it was a very tricky business 
figuring out what we could say and when and to whom and how. Uh, and also negotiating to make sure that we weren't going to be sued, um, which was, you know, GM, it turns out, had two board meetings um, to decide not to sue the University of California. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of a summary of the kinds of things that I've been doing that have brought up these ethical issues. And uh, I don't know, we're going to do a yeah, break uh, now. We'll, do, we'll take a brief break. And then yeah. Quick break now, and you guys can think about questions you have, and we will get back. Before we get to some of your, your questions, um, I have a, a couple that came to mind. Um, one came to mind because of my experience teaching research ethics to researchers and the, the problem of talking to them, for example, about manipulating images and talking to them about how one can do that and get away with it. And so what you're doing while you're telling people about a problem that's out there, you're also telling them how to do it. So do you ever worry that you're getting up in a talk like this one and saying, here there are services you can find that will, do, that will cover CAPTCHA and be able to, uh, be able, you know, for, for pennies you can uh, use them? Do you feel like you're spreading information more widely about how to do bad stuff? Uh, so, so the premise being that someone in the audience is a latent criminal and, and actually, I have but, but for my many, talk, many they would, are, yeah, but, but for my talk, they would have had got led a straight life. But now, um, I, I would say that uh, uh, I do not have that much concern because an afternoon with Google will disabuse you of, an, of the notion that this stuff is at all secret. Um, however. I will, there, there is an aspect of this that, that at times does give us pause. So, uh, for example, we did a fairly comprehensive evaluation of these capture solving services and uh, characterizing their latency and correctness and how many people they had and so on and so forth, uh, including in some cases we managed to uh, interview the founders, um, which was bizarre. You would just send these. Uh, we sent these random questions because we managed to, there, there was a bunch of technical stuff to figure out who actually ran these things because they tend to not announce that, but they had made some mistakes and we found them and Sight Unseen would send to you know, some Chinese gentleman, hey, we're writing research, would you, you know, answer this query? In the end, one of the things that I think um, made me a little uncomfortable is that we found that in the criminal underground, uh, people would use our paper as a consumer reports. And they would say, well, look, their, their paper says this is the most cost effective one to use. <laughs> and people would advertise their service, saying, you know, if you don't believe us, you know, the University of California says that our service is, is the most effective one. <laughs> and, and that was certainly not, not our intent. Um, I think the capture solving is, is uh, you know, in, this, in the spectrum of, of white to black is the beigest of the things we are dealing with. I mean, there are some legitimate uses for capture solving, like for the blind. Now, I, I don't think that's what the, the majority of them are being used for. Um, but uh, I think on balance, you know, this is what you end up weighing when you do these kinds of things, is are your expected benefits from having done the w research do they outweigh your ex expected uh, negative impacts? Uh, now, sometimes you can get surprised in either direction. And so you, you, know, you do your best to make those guesses. And you usually have, you know, all of these questions are some combination of different ethical systems. So th what I just described here, this balancing test about outcomes is you know, what we would call you know, deontological ethics. But there are certain things you just w won't do. And that's where kind of virtue ethics comes in. It's like, OK, I have this balancing test between what are the positives and the negatives. But no matter how good the positive is, you know, I'm not going to shoot somebody. It's just I'm, like there's, there's not enough positives for me to go and do that. Um, and uh, capture solving, the costs are relatively modest. Uh, it also helped that we were very careful whenever we engaged with that ecosystem that we were working in the context, the people who were being abused, uh, we would partner with. So they were no, like when we were dealing with stuff related to Google, Google would be a partner in our work. And so that, and they were the ones in some sense who were, who, upon whom the abuse was being visited. 
Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So this, you actually have touched on another sort of general question that I need to preface a little bit. Most of the topics we have in this program are topics where you say, here is something we do, and there are some downsides to this. What should we do about it? Mm -hmm. And actually, most of what you do is trying to do something about a problem that we have with the internet, uh, broadly speaking. Um, and yet, even within your desire to do that, there are questions. And one is on the research side, and the other, in other words, how do you do research? And the other is how your research might be used. But if we talk about how your research is done, um, I, during the break, it sounded like you were talking a little bit about a question of um, how you get approval from the university to be able to do questionable things. So can you talk for a moment about, uh, do you have to have Human Subjects Committee review what you're doing? Um, you've talked to campus council. What, who do you talk to? Who is watching you? It, it depends on the project. And, and so um, there are going to be uh, a variety of different people who need to be involved. So if we are dealing with any research that directly involves human subjects, then there's going to be an institutional review board that we need to submit uh, something to where they need to understand what are the risks uh, of the research to those people and what controls do we have in place, and then they need to approve it before we can move forward. Um, that is a subset of ethics. That is by, and, and I think my community uh, frequently likes to waive uh, having a human subjects review as, as the badge of ethics. It covers a, a subset of, of ethical challenges. Like, I'll give you an example. There are no human subject issues in the uh, General Motors, the, the, the car work that I did. One of our concerns when we did this was that at the time we did it, General Motors was basically in receivership to the US government. They, were, they had effectively just escaped bankruptcy by the US government coming in and supporting them. And this was right after that. And it was just after the Toyota unintended acceleration debacle that cost Toyota a huge amount of money. And, and there was significant worry. Like, it, if we had come out, we, by the way, we did not go and publish any paper ever that said it was General Motors cars can all be taken over. Um, we never disclosed who it was. We never disclosed how to do it, even in, which was an odd thing to do in a research paper where you don't describe exactly what you did. But among the issues were we didn't want, it would have been the largest recall in US history if they had been forced to do a recall because of this. And it's quite likely a lot of people would have lost their jobs. And a uh, human subjects board will not, that's not their job. They won't look at that. Uh, and so for that, we don't necessarily have people to turn to. There is not like an independent ethics review board that looks at that. We have to think about that ourselves. For other things, we have legal, uh, we go to campus council for things that are legal. And legal intersects with ethical, but is actually quite different. You can be ethical and legal, and you can be ethical and illegal, and, and vice versa. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing that every combination of the two exists in real life. Uh, and so any time we know we are going to touch on something where there is the potential uh, for either criminal liability or where there's the potential for, and I think to a first approximation, campus council is much more concerned about civil liability because the US Attorney's Office, by and large, is, is not obsessed with suing university professors for doing measurement projects. Um, uh, then we end up, before we even start you know, designing the project, we go to general counsel and get them to, to talk to us about it. But then there are other things when we want a resource, like, I needed to have these special credit cards with which I was going to buy drugs, and they were probably going to steal the money, or we didn't know that they weren't going to steal the money. And imagine going to an institution as conservative as a university and say, and by the way, I need credit cards under different names for buying illegal drugs, and they're going to steal the money too. OK? <laughs> And that actually had to go all the way to the Office of the President um, and the Office of Research Compliance. And that, that was a, a legendary meeting. But they were very supportive in the end once we explained why there, were, there weren't easier alternatives and what we were going to do to keep everything controlled. And so you, know, you document your process meticulously. And they, they asked us to do certain things, like we had this special lock on the door. And we limited 
which drugs we are going to buy according to the University of California's interpretation of California drug importation law. And so, and so there, there were always, you know, there was some back and forth to design the methodology in a way that would be in compliance. Um, but, I, you know, I have ended up at various times needing to deal with a lot of different parts of campus. It's not as singular as just, uh, you know, uh, human subjects. So um, this is the first time I've met you in person. Um, and I have the feeling that you are extremely thoughtful and careful about doing these things, which is, which is great. But do you, it seems to me that a lot of this depends on you. I mean, I, I'm just trying to figure out how much of this could have been done by you without asking those questions. How far could you have gone to get those credit cards, to drop buy those drugs? <laughs> and it, so and, and so this, is a, this is a serious, legitimate question. I mean, should we? Do we need that independent review board for, for what computer scientists might be doing? Yeah. Uh, so I don't understand the different. The, the the two questions seem different. There's the one: Could I have done it without? If could I have just broken all of our policy rules and done it independently? Like, I I, I think I could have, but for the resource issue. So you know, I I. I guess I could have spent all my own money on that stuff as opposed to using the money that our research sponsors provided. But the, the, you know, that would have made it a less attractive activity. <laughs> um, uh, but technically, nothing would have prevented me from doing what I was doing. I think I would have felt much more nervous. I think one of the things that, um, that puts us in a much stronger position when we present our work is being able, because people ask, like, how in the world did you do that, surely? And then that we are able to explain at great lengths um, the kinds of things that we did in order to control this. Now, I will say that in, my, in the computer science community, there's been a tremendous evolution over the last two decades. You know, so in the, in the mid-'90s, uh, it, it was very much a cowboy mentality. All kinds of crazy things got done without any notion. The no, human subject was something for, like, for doctors or, or pharmaceutical people. It was not something that people in my world did. And you, know, you would routinely read papers where they said, oh, and we attached an optical tap and then grabbed all of the traffic going in and out of our institution and all of this other stuff. And now uh, you, know, you couldn't get that paper accepted without a long explanation for how it was that what you did was actually OK. Um, so, so, uh, so that that actually is, I think, a shift in in those years for that field. But what I was I was thinking is that um, it sounds like you felt that at certain junctures you weren't required to get human subjects review. There was no committee to look at some of the ethical questions that you came up with. So you asked those questions. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, yeah, there are portions for which there is no special committee. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And um, and it's not it's not clear where you quite draw those boundaries. Because it, it's certainly the case that there's, uh, I, even in the strongest advocates for uh, ethical oversight, I, I've yet to hear one where they, they were you know, thinking of protecting the fiduciary interests of a company. That's not usually in the remit of, of and, and so, and I think different people would have different points of view on this. And in fact, I know there are other researchers who took very different points of view and, and for example, said no. Um, we disagree with the choice you made. You should have come out and disclosed everything as a way to force the issue, um, and that the you know the shaming of the company would have driven them to go and fix this stuff more quickly. And and there you know are, I think are differences of opinion on the cost benefit analysis of, of those kinds of choices. So so one option of course would be to require all faculty doing projects like this to come and speak to the public and ask them <laughs> what are the issues you see that we should be addressing. I, I, I actually think that's a, that's a, the the being able to have uh, a broader set of inputs about where the questions are I think is, is really valuable. Because you, there is this kind of group think that goes on when you do research in any field because you're so focused on the prize that uh, you have to take an effort to step back and say, all right, you know, how would other people feel when it was described what we did in the following way? Okay. So this is all a good segue to some of the questions. And the first one is about drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and they're wondering what happens with all those drugs you collected. <laughs> uh, basically, they're saying, why wasn't it confiscated by customs? Or was it? How, what happened to them? 5% confiscation rate in general. 
All right, and so one, one interesting issue in the context of counterfeits broadly writ is that the previous model of counterfeiting is something that would like come in on you know, container ships into the New York Harbor and then show up on the streets of Canal Street and then you know, have some kind of underground networks. None of that exists anymore. Uh, by and large, everything is just shipped direct. Uh, and that's for all kinds of counterfeiting. Uh, because we have a, basically an amazing postal system uh, and package delivery system. And so, uh, and the odds of any particular one being interdicted is incredibly small. And when I talked to a postal inspector, he, he was very happy that they got 5%. Um, so uh, the reason they didn't is because there's, there's way too much for them to possibly go through all of this stuff and check it. As to what eventually happened, so uh, we, we kept it around for a while to do, a, we had a variety of follow-on projects that we're doing, um, you know, some, we did some projects because we were curious, you know, are the drugs what they say they are? Um, because that goes to the, in some sense, the, the economic model that the people are pursuing. Uh, and then we did some forensic analysis as well to try to identify commonalities between different suppliers and so forth. And most of them, I think, were eventually destroyed because we didn't have a use for all the stuff that we had, had acquired. <laughs> okay, well put. Okay, so, um, all right, and so, um, let's see. I think so we did promise that no one would ingest any yeah, of the okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. I was, I mean, I, I, mean I, have, I, have to, I have to say, I suspect a lot of people are thinking what I'm thinking. It seems that there should be something more solid in place to say, all right, this has arrived, it's sequestered in this room, and there's going to be a log, and that somebody's going to say... Oh, all of those things tracks, existed. Yeah, and someone um, tracks There was not a person or, who, uh, who's j outside of the group whose job it was, though, to do that. And um, this is not something that the university has as a, as a, as a service. The, yeah, I mean, when I'm thinking that you know, there's a, a legal process where people, for example, do work with animals in laboratories or they're working in hospital settings, working with controlled substances, there's a pretty rigorous process of trying to keep track of it, but it's done by the people themselves. Right. There can be external audits, though, of, of that. So. Absolutely, and, and we could have always been audited. I will say that n there were no controlled substances being dealt with, and there was nothing that was... Uh, uh, there was nothing, there were no drugs, this is part of the many uh, negotiations that we had, that uh, had any, uh, were attractive for any abuse-oriented purpose. So, you know, like, we cornered the market on counterfeit Claritin, I think, for a little while. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's not like people were breaking in to get that. <laughs> And, and just to be clear, we have a talk coming up l in the future about um, political science experiments where they might put money into an election campaign yep. to see what happens. And in certain places, that money might be overwhelming, so you shift what's going on. You're pretty confident that the amount that you contributed to this industry was a small percentage of the total, and you didn't somehow prop up some company Right. That's some rogue company. And this goes to this general question about the, the ethical issue of giving money to criminal enterprises who are, you know, inherently criminal and up to no good. And is the, are you, make, are you making them succeed when they would not have otherwise? And this is, you know, in the alternate world where you didn't do this work, would we be better off for dint of not having, uh, having given money to criminals? Now, I can say in these cases, categorically, we were an incredibly tiny fraction. And I can say that categorically. Because of another piece of research I didn't discuss, but has its own ethical issues, um, which is that the largest uh, counterfeit Russian pharmaceutical organizations, which uh, most of whom we, we ended up buying from, because of some both internal conflicts and conflicts with the, with the Russian state, the FSB, which is the Russian equivalent of the FBI, um, confiscated some of their computers image their drives, and then through a very complicated chain, parts of which I do not entirely understand, uh, the back-end server uh, contents from, it ended up in our lab. And so we know every single order that they had. And we can identify all of our orders within that. And we were a very small fraction. <laughs> That's fascinating at many levels, and it's about how you how you got that. Um, 
So somebody's asking for some very practical, specific question here. Maybe you'll take a stab at answering it. So if as a result of legitimate participation in internet transactions, you begin to be inundated by unsolicited offers, emails, et cetera, would it be unethical for you to subsequently block ads or use a VPN to reduce such spam? Um, I don't think that there is, you have any ethical obligation to uh, desist from using an ad blocker. Right? I think you always have the choice to use an ad blocker. The thing that, um, the thing that you need to remember when using ad blockers is that the services that you use that are free are ultimately being paid for out of advertising. So there is a tragedy of the commons risk that if everyone is very effective at blocking ads, that we will not be able to have these free things. And so it, it behooves us to think about um, are we actually willing to come up with another form of payment, like paying direct to have a Gmail account, and paying direct to read CNN, and paying direct to do that uh, in lieu of advertising. Um, and then we should you know, live our lives according to what, what we believe. And I think that that's, that's always an ethical thing to do. But it's, it's, it does have an impact if everyone does it. Yeah. Good. So um, this person is asking about the process that you go through for these activities. And I, I suspect it will vary. But they're, they're wondering, at what point would you engage a government entity or a business entity um, that may have an interest in what you're looking at? And then how do you encourage their involvement? I, I sometimes, like with the auto companies, they may have been nervous about you looking to see whether you can take over their cars. So. Yeah, so I'll, st I'll start with the auto one, and that's because it, it, it highlights some of the challenges we have in, in my field. Um, so we did not engage with the automotive industry until we had basically all of our results. And there were really two reasons for that. One is because we wanted our results to be uh, representative of what a, a third party could do. And if we had been working with the automotive companies, they would say, but you had inside knowledge, you had all of this. And the extent to which we had fully explored this would be suspect, because they'd say, you're sponsored by the auto companies. Why should we trust you? To say? And so we wanted to keep it separate. The other reason is because um, there are a number of industries in the US that when you disclose that there are problems, um, uh, they will use legal process to stymie you continuing your research. Uh, and I know few people who do the kind of work that I do who have not received a cease and desist letter at least once. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is much easier to negotiate uh, when you know that you're going to do it in good faith. Like We never had any intention of naming and shaming or making a big deal. But they don't know that. But we're in a much better position to negotiate um, an arrangement if we've already done the research and you know, it, has, it has been accepted for publication. And now, that's a much bigger deal if they're going to quash a paper that has been accepted for publication. Uh, and then we can figure out, OK, how, how are we going to, how are we going to work with you to, um, uh, to, to best address these issues? So given your success, it just occurred to me, I mean, do you now have enough of a track record that you might not have that problem? You could go to the power toothbrush maker that's Bluetooth connected, and you could say, I'm going to see if we can take over your toothbrush. Um, and they would be happy to engage with you because they know you won't. So there are two answers to the question. Um, it depends, all right? So like, uh, I and we, in fact, did this study. We did exactly this study, where we went and we took 100 companies, and then we approached them under a variety of different guises. One was me, but then we had independent researchers not affiliated with universities, lesser known researchers at universities, and said precisely this. Here's your flagship product. We would like to do a security audit of it, and we would like your approval as a legal safe harbor from violations of any number of laws, DMCA and so forth. And the first thing you find out is that you are in a much better shape if you're a well-known academic researcher than not. And if you are not, then they will say, go jump off a cliff, if they even answer you. 
Um, but as a, as a university researcher, in particular as a better known one, you definitely get more engagement because they want to hire your students and so on and so forth. Um, that doesn't mean that they say yes always. There are quite a few who don't say yes. And it also will depend on like the electric toothbrush. I think it's probably a pretty fair game. We do a lot of work in, uh, in aviation security. Uh, Boeing is not showing up with an airplane for us to go and work on. That they are, they are, they, I think would prefer, in, in their ideal world, that we would never do this work. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, part of that could be the, the recognition. That, I mean, if you discover something that allows you, for example, to, you know, you, you work out the technology to take over a car or an airplane remotely, um, you might not have any intention of sharing it, but the question is how secure is what you're doing, and maybe somebody would be able to get hold of it. So, th and so they'd rather not have people looking at that. I, actually, I, in, in this particular case, it's, I think um, I am more cynical than you uh, <laughs> about why they don't uh, want us to, but that's a separate issue. Uh, but I do, we actually did spend quite a bit of time um, in the context of uh, automotive work worried very much about the security of what we're doing um, because uh, when we first started contacting government agencies, um, the places where we thought we would get the most supportive response, which would be like Department of Transportation, uh, was not where we got the most interest. Uh, we got by far the most interest, both from this government and from others on the offensive side, who said, this is really interesting. We would like to know more. <laughs> and we didn't contact them. Okay, And so we actually went to great lengths to make it very difficult even for ourselves to access the research that we had done um, because we were concerned that there was actually substantive, we never wanted what we had done to be used as a weapon. Yeah. Uh, and we knew that there was a lot of interest in that. Yeah, okay. Um, so this, you've, you've actually begun to almost touch on this, but the next question um, is, do you ever decide not to look into something brought to your attention? If so, what are the factors that you consider? Um, there are, there are th uh, th questions that we would love to answer that we can't think of an ethical way to answer, <laughs> all right? Um, where we know perfectly well of unethical ways to answer them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that entire, uh, like, all, uh, we, for example, at various points in time could completely shut down all kinds of botnets. But there's not a legal way for us to do that. And so we, we neglect, we do not explore that, that line of research. Um, there are, uh, I'm trying to think of, though, of something that is closer to what you're, I mean, so for example, we make a point not, we don't do work on th things that are related to any kind of weaponization because it makes us uncomfortable. Um, I think we have also stayed away, by and large, from research in areas where there is violent criminal activity, largely because of concerns for students. So we don't want our students to be doing research on something for which um, the positive outcome of the research would create a call for some criminal organization to be mad at the students. Um, and so those are some examples. I don't know if I have a general playbook for how we, uh, quite a bit, I'll just be absolutely frank, quite a bit of our research is entirely opportunistic, uh, where you know, there will come, you, know, you asked previously about how do we engage with companies. Sometimes it's because we show up to them, here's this thing that we're thinking about and we'd like to do with you. Sometimes we've solved it already and want to tell them about it. But other times they come to us, and that's quite common. Um, and there are some of those we don't do because, uh, we, you know, we don't particularly like the goal. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's on a case by case basis makes a lot of sense. So, um, so I, I know that you are not a policy maker or a law maker, but you probably are aware of those policies and laws that affect cybersecurity. So it's a reasonable question. From what you know, how far behind is policy and law? In dealing with cybersecurity, are we? Do we have some room, some ground to make up here? Um, 
This is a very tricky question. And I used to think it was easy. And I said, oh, the laws are terrible. Um, and then I spent some time with, uh, with uh, legislative aides and came to the conclusion, good God, don't let them write any laws. <laughs> that, that, uh, so I think there are different, uh, I'm also not very optimistic about legislation in the current era. Like I don't think, I don't think we have a, uh, particularly at the federal level, uh, I don't think we have a, a coalition of people who are interested in doing the right thing such that law is an effective mechanism. So when we have explored policy options of work that we've done, we've tried to, it, it, I think there's a, an assumption that law is the primary mechanism for enacting policy. And a lot of times there's other ways to do it, like this thing that we did with uh, shutting down merchant accounts that's now a standard uh, technique uh, did not involve the creation of any laws. It was the enforcement of existing contract regulations that all credit card companies have with their member companies. And every bank that is subject to a relationship with Visa and MasterCard agrees that all transactions have to be legal both in the country in which the merchant operates and in the country in which the purchaser operates. And that if they don't, that that bank is liable and that Visa will find them or shut down their relationship with the, with the association. And so it's just by convincing Visa to enforce their existing rules and then finding the incentives that would get people to hunt down the places where that wasn't happening that, that got that to happen. Now, it could have been done through a law, and I had um, at least one senator who was very interested in writing a law because, as his staffer put it, he would really like to have written a law, um, <laughs> which was a. T <laughs> but I don't think that that would have actually have, have led to as effective an outcome. I mean, law is very heavyweight. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean after, as you said that, it occurred to me. I mean, the very nature of what we're talking about is so it's constantly evolving and changing, and law is a very blunt instrument. It might be not. I, I agree. There are some places, look, and, and you have to separate between law and regulation. And so, uh, like, I, I think that there is going to be a realignment uh, at some point, both on the criminal side and on the civil side, in how we deal with electronic information, because there are a few too many problems that we run into. Um, we don't have a compelling way to talk about privacy interests under we have a lot of kind of balkanized different efforts to deal with privacy in the United States. We, we don't have a general framework the way the Europeans have put together. Uh, the European framework, GDPR, is quite heavyweight, however, and, and presents its own unintended side effects. And so this is not going to be something that happens, that happens quickly. Um, so I don't know, I don't have a, a very nice answer for that question. I apologize whoever <laughs> asked it. I just, what I would say is that it is not simple. It is a very complicated question. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, question, right, sir. Uh, yeah, um, a few minutes ago you talked about the difference between controlling, taking over a car and taking over an airplane from Boeing. And are there practicalities in this in the sense that it's one thing to, for a few thousand bucks, I guess, to get the access to a car, an empty parking lot, and a few red cones, but A, Boeing is probably not going to loan you a plane. Yeah. You could buy one, but that would cost many tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. And it, but it's very important. I mean, think about 9-11, how that would have gone if they could just you know, take over a, a, a so, computerized uh, plane. Uh, I will, I will tell you two things, one of which will hope, maybe they'll both make you feel good. The first is uh, that it's actually not that difficult. All right? And the, answer, the reason is the most uh, common transport aircraft in the United States, the 737, its, uh, its underlying avionics architecture has not changed significantly for 25 years. And so there are a lot of these planes that have been decommissioned. And so you can buy the parts that you care about uh, on the third party market quite easily. Um, now, here's the other part that if that didn't make you feel good. Um, <laughs> the situation with planes is much better. All right, and I'll just tell you categorically that planes are, the software is incredibly well written. And um, I'm not going to tell you there are no problems, but um, 
it, it is not the kind of thing that a, you know, a couple of kids in the afternoon will figure out how to do this. Uh, and there will, it, we are unlikely, based on where our research is so far, to have uh, cyber attacks on airplanes that do not that do not require significant operational capabilities on the part of the attacker. So it's going to foreclose most organizations outside of state actors from, from playing in that space. I, I, I'm so, unfortunately, we need to wrap up now. But um, first, I think you have delivered as you promised. We now have far more questions oh, than answers. Um, but it's much appreciated. Fascinating talk. Thanks very much. And thank you for the audience. Yeah.